So I just want to start with a little bit of breath. If you could just close your eyes for a minute or just look down towards your lap and take a nice big breath. And now take one more breath, and as you exhale, imagine blowing Muhammad's little beach balls out in front of you. And go ahead and open your eyes. It's amazing how just settling down a little bit can make a big impact. I work with a lot of college students and high school students. They come to see me for a variety of reasons. But the techniques that I teach them, which involves a lot of breathing and a lot of meditation techniques, they're telling me makes all the difference in the world in their schoolwork. So all of you that are still in IIT, it's a really good technique. When you sit down, I don't know if you're like me, when I used to open those finals, my first reaction was, this is not what I study. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're telling me they all had the same reaction. But when they sit down and just close their eyes for a minute and breathe, and then they open their eyes and they open their exams, they know all that information. It's that stress in the middle. It kind of gets you snagged up for a moment. So try it. See if that technique helps. They're telling me their grades are getting better, and they're finishing their exams before everybody else in class. So we're all up for that. I'm going to take your attention actually right now to a system in our body that I think is so amazing, the fight or flight response. Just imagine you seem to find yourself in an encounter with this face. And before your mouth can even form the words, oh, shoot, your hormones start surging. Your hippocampus sets off an alarm in your body. The adrenaline starts pumping, the cortisol. Your adrenaline sends your heart beating faster, sends your blood pressure up, gets you a little more energy. Your kidneys quiet down to conserve water. All of your excess systems shut down. You don't need your reproductive system or your digestive system if you're running for your life. Everything sort of settles in. But a lot of things take off a little bit more. Your veins constrict, causing that blood going to your heart to pick up force massively. You felt it. It could be anything that just sets you off at that point. We're going to take it to a little bit better idea, though. Not a lot of us can, can really relate to the tiger running. I can't, and I can't imagine staying ahead of anything that's running 35 miles an hour chasing me. So I'm going to take you to a little more personal story, something you might be able to relate to that has a happy ending. I decided one morning to squeeze in an extra round of golf on the Big Island. I headed off by myself. I rounded that first hole, headed up to the next tee box, turned to get my things, went to get out of my cart, and she was glaring at me. Her and about a dozen of her friends surrounded my cart. <laughs> they started, they call it squeaking, but I'll take it as screaming at me. And everything shut down in my body. My heart started racing. My focus narrowed down. I needed to try to find a way to get away from them. I didn't know if they wanted food from me or if it was mating season. And I looked like the kind of girl who'd go after a peahen's guy. <laughs> but I wasn't taking any chances. Luckily, those systems that we practiced, just even that breathing, started bringing my heart rate back down, started getting me a little bit more control. If you're a golfer, you know it's almost impossible with some screaming people behind you to actually hit that ball as anything in the office can be the same way. So we need to narrow those systems down, get us a little bit more control on these things. So take it back to your office. How many people have somebody at their office that looks just like this? Could be your boss telling you you've got hot deadlines. Could be that guy in accounting telling you one more time you're over budget. We run into this an awful lot. And then there's this guy at the office distracting you all the time. <laughs> it might not be a living being, could be that ding of your email. Could be that noise that your phone makes when that text message comes through. It's something that's pulling you away all the time. It could be those thoughts about some financial issue. Or maybe your teenage daughter just learned how to drive. When we're, our fight or flight response takes over, it can save our life. But when it's long term, it's a chronic issue. It starts to cause damage to our body and to our minds. We need to find those tools to take us back a notch. 75% of insomnia is because of stress issues. There was a recent study that was done. By 5, 000, there were 5,000 men that were studied for 30 years. They found those that had work stress had a much higher incidence of strokes. Heart failure is the leading cause of death in this country. More women die of heart failure than of every cancer combined. Six studies came out in the last two years 
just giving us definitive proof that work stress contributes to those heart failures. In every study, they found the people that had the highest stress levels worked more hours, but they worked out more. They ate healthier, they didn't smoke, they didn't drink. Actually, they were healthier people. They had a much higher incidence of cardiac arrest and a higher mortality from that cardiac arrest. Leading the researchers to say that, above all other factors, it's the stress levels that feasibly can kill you and give you a cardiac arrest. The American Heart Association actually came out with a warning saying that job stress can lead to higher heart disease rates. So it's something we need to start taking seriously. When you're not sleeping, your immune system's not rebuilding. I don't know if anybody in the audience has stress levels, but I hear a lot that people are not sleeping right. They're not falling asleep. And the biggest reason that we're hearing about it is that chatter, those thoughts. You're thinking about what you did today, what you need to do tomorrow, what else you need to do, what might happen, what might not happen. And those thoughts are going all the time. Could take you an hour, hour and a half to fall asleep at night. If your immune system's not rebuilding, if that neurogenesis is not happening, that happens during the night, where does that leave you? You need to get sleep. And then you finally get to sleep. You wake up in the middle of the night for whatever reason. And you can't doze back off right away. And before you can actually get into a sound sleep, they're back, all those thoughts. But this time they're darker. They're bigger and they're louder. Everything's bigger, darker, and louder at 3 o'clock in the morning. It all looks a little gloomier. So you need to find tools to get you to sleep so your body can start rebuilding, so you can start taking care of yourself a little bit more. The Institute of Medicine last year published studies that said that 116 million Americans are suffering from chronic pain, leading to a cost of over $639 billion. Stress can activate pain. Sleep issues aggravate pain, and pain exasperates stress. It's a complete spiral. A lot of the people that we see with pain, a lot of it has to do with stress levels. A lot of those college students I was telling you about, they're sent to me because they have migraines, they have headaches, they have all kinds of chronic pain, and the doctors can't figure out what's wrong. And we start talking to them, and a huge percentage of it is stress levels. It's just dealing with the day-to-day -day of what's going on. The Yale studies recently stated that, and I don't know if you saw this, gray matter actually shrinks due to chronic stress. It's kind of big. Your brain shrinks because of too much stress. Then you have less brain to deal with future stress. <laughs> Where does that leave you? Neurogenesis slows down. But we found that stress can be lessened by new neurons. Well, if your neurogenesis slowed down, you don't have new neurons to deal with stress more accurately, right? It's a vicious cycle. It's taking yourself out of that circle all of the time. We need to find a good solution, a really good solution that's going to target this problem. Stress is a perception in the brain. What's stressful for you might not be stressful for me. It could be stressful for her. We don't know. It's all a perception. Think of going to the amusement park. You get on that tilt-a-whirl, that roller coaster, that Ferris wheel. For those of us that are enjoying that ride, we're producing amazing cancer-fighting chemicals in our body. All good antibodies. But if you're terrified, it's that cortisol and that adrenaline that's pouring out in your body, doing damage to your body because you're scared. It's all a perception. So how do we take that and make that a positive change for us. How do we target it exactly? Because there's a lot of things that they talk about. Stress is a really big, just a really big thing out there these days. And they say, you know, take this class, take that class, try this. You need to target exactly what you're doing. One of the things that we've been doing since the early 1950s is biofeedback. Not me personally, but <laughs> it's been a good targeted solution for a lot of people. With biofeedback, we use machines to see how your body responds to what you're thinking enabling you to change your thoughts, your emotions, and your behaviors to get your body to respond the way that you want to. A lot of it revolves around the autonomic nervous system, things you didn't think you had control over that you actually do. And the machines help point that out to you. They're very sensitive. There's a number of different modalities that we use depending on what your goals are. Vascular contraction lets through much less warm blood to your extremities, to your tissue. We use a lot of peripheral biofeedback 
because the more relaxed you are, the more blood comes to your tissue, the warmer your extremities look at. Something we use a lot, if you think about it, it's been used for years with headaches, with migraines, because what you're doing is dilating those blood vessels and letting that blood run to where it needs to be. The galvanic skin response all has to do with sweat. What we're measuring is not necessarily sweat glands. Unfortunately, physiologically, we can't do that. What we're measuring is the electricity in the salts, in the sweat, to see what your reaction is to things, to see what's most useful for you. EMG is electromyography. It's all muscle control. Think of the first place that you stress. The shoulders go up, the neck, get, neck gets tense. We put sensors on. They actually go with the electrical component of that muscle contraction, and they tell you when you're contracting that muscle, giving you advance notice of what's happening before it becomes a chronic problem. By then, we've probably also learned what's going to relax you the most. So you can incorporate that at that point and get rid of this problem before it becomes something major. Heart rate variability, we found, is a good indication of mortality and morbidity from different heart conditions. We use it a lot with peak performance work. I train a lot of athletes, and we use it a lot to get your heart in a good recovery place. It's getting your whole system in that place. We always use small machines, and we try to see exactly what's working best for you. If you think about it, when I work with a lot of engineers, we tend to do a lot of left brain things. We tend to do muscle relaxations or something that's really going to take on that left side of your brain that's going to work the best for you. For some people, visualization works the best. That's another technique that we use an awful lot, and it works for a lot of people. Or some kind of breath techniques, like just that little bit of breathing we were doing at the very beginning. It's finding what's exactly appropriate for you so you can get the most out of it immediately. We're kind of an immediate society. We want to make you feel better as fast as you can and get you those good tools. I just want to conclude with a really inspiring story. There are two doctors who are therapists in Israel who are working with children. They had found that, unfortunately, because of the situation there, there's more trauma of children than there are mental health professionals to help those children. They started in a city in the south teaching them just breathing techniques. Things similar to what you were doing, just blowing those, balloon, those balls away or just some kind of breathing techniques and a little bit of that peripheral biofeedback. They taught it to, they had 1,500 students. Unfortunately, they only got it to about half of them before war broke out and the rockets started overhead. When the war settled down, they went through all those children to see what kind of state they were in and evaluated everybody. The children that had just learned that breathing, something that simple, had 50% less PTSD and 50% less trauma disorders. Just that little bit of breathing. It doesn't take a whole lot. Now the department, or the Minister of Education, I understand, is looking at bringing it to all the students in all the schools. It's something that can help everyone and it can help you on a very small level, but it's using those techniques. Another big thing that we use is neurofeedback, brainwave biofeedback. It's putting sensors on your head. They listen to your brain. You see on the screen what your brain's doing. There's an instantaneous feedback. There's usually waves you're trying to suppress and waves you're trying to increase. You change what you're thinking about depending on the results we're looking for on the screen. Because of the neuroplasticity of the brain, the more you fire what you need to be firing, your brain starts to hardwire that way. It's a long-term change. I can't say permanent. The brain's plastic. Things happen. But we get to see long-term changes in people. It's probably best known, and you've read about it the most lately, with focus issues. It's one of the primary things that we use it for. And it's used with children. It's used with adults. Sometimes over 40, I hear a lot of people saying they just don't memorize those journals as well. They just don't focus quite as sharp as I used to when I was 20. And we start seeing a big difference because what's going on in the brain is something that we can really see and we can start taking those components out of it. So it's a great holistic tool that can give you some power over your body. It's probably one of the best power sources that you can get is just learning to breathe and learning some techniques to take control of yourself. And that's all I have.